Welcome to Levels Plus Weekly episode 13. It's been about two weeks since we last did this. Um, I've had stuff going on. I had the COVID vaccine basically knock me out last week. And the week before that, I needed to just kind of take a break from doing projects. Um, but we're back. We're ready to keep on going. And it's March now. And I really like March because it's Women's History Month. We just celebrated International Women's Day on March 8th. And I want to spend part of Levels Plus Weekly for the rest of this month talking about gender in games to some extent. And with Zelda's 35th anniversary just passing, uh, I've got my Zelda 30th anniversary fan shirt that I got off of Tee Public on today. Um, five years behind and it doesn't have Breath of the Wild Zelda on it. I'll have to see if maybe the artist updated this at some point. Um, but I think it would be a great time to talk about the titular princess herself and how the series has handled her role from her very first game on the NES and Famicom all the way up to Breath of the Wild, Hyrule Wars Age of Calamity, and the upcoming Breath of the Wild 2. I have an article that I will be referencing through this discussion. Um, here's the magic where the link pops up thanks to the power of editing. Um, I'll also have it in the description so you can check it out. But I'm gonna be referencing that while we're talking about Zelda because I, I might as well have some sort of script for this um, because I've already done the work. <laughs> so I might as well take advantage of the work that I've done. So just a little bit of uh, uh, explanation of what I'm gonna be doing. So, Zelda is one of the most prominent female video game characters in all of games. Um, she's been, through her various incantations and, and descendants and such, been in a lot of games. She's one of the first to have a series named after a woman. And she's one of Nintendo's most prominent female characters. Um, she was the third woman introduced into Super Smash Bros. following Samus in the original game and Peach um, in Melee, who got a little bit of a higher billing than Zelda did. Um, so that kind of shows how important she is to Nintendo as a whole. Um, and this, the unfortunate thing is that she just hasn't had a really great situation the entire time that she has existed as a character and and the various versions of her that have appeared throughout the series have almost always been kidnapped little agency never been playable in the mainline games save one minor exception which we'll cover so i want to talk about this and i want to talk about how breath of the wild has changed some things and what I hope the sequel to Breath of the Wild will do with Zelda. Um, so a few little parameters. Um, we're gonna go in chronological order by release. So we're gonna start with the NES Legend of Zelda and work our way to Breath of the Wild 2. Um, I'm gonna lump the same Zelda together. So for example, in Ocarina of Time, and Majora's Mask, those are in the same time set with Link. It's the same Link, but Zelda isn't in Majora's Mask, but she's referenced, so I just put those those two games together as one set. Another example is Breath of the Wild, Hyrule Wars, Age of Calamity, and the upcoming Breath of the Wild 2. Those are all the same Zelda, so I've just lumped those games together as one set. Um, I'm going to comment on her role being active, i.e., being engaged heavily in the game's narrative and seen frequently during the quest. Now I'm also going to reference if she's been kidnapped or not, and then I will provide a little backstory. And I'm not going to be reading this verbatim, but I will be referencing it heavily, just to try to make things a little bit clearer and snappier for this video. Um, because like I said, I've already done the work and the research, so I might as well take advantage of it. 
Um, my sources for this were my own personal experience. I played the majority of these games. I also referenced the Hyrule Historia um, publication that Dark Horse localized, as well as referring to the Zelda.gamepedia.com Princess Zelda page, um, just to get a little bit more background on the games I was not as familiar with. All right, let's get started with the original Legend of Zelda on the NES and Famicom. This Zelda would be considered passive. And again, I want to refer to passive and active being in the game itself. Um, so this Zelda is passive. She has been kidnapped. I do want to elaborate slightly in that this Zelda in the manual is described to have taken the Triforce of Wisdom, split it into eight parts, and stowed each piece in a treacherous dungeon, which is pretty badass, I have to say, especially if you consider this is the 1980s, and women in general were not given a lot of badass roles in American video games. I'm being very specific here because in Japan there were a lot more women protagonists than America ever saw on the NES and Famicom. Um, so that's really, really cool. And, and it's good to see that she's like diving into these dungeons and doing these really dangerous things. It's unfortunate we never get to see that in the game because when the game starts, Ganon has kidnapped her and it's up to Link to rescue her. So she's just basically hanging out in the final dungeon behind a cage of flames waiting for Link to come in and, and dispel the fire, even though she's the magician <laughs> um, of, the, of the trio. So one would think she would have figured out a way out of there, but alas, she did not. Um, so the adventure of Link, same Link, different Zelda, kind of a unique situation. So the first game Zelda doesn't appear in Zelda 2. It's actually her ancestor that is the Zelda in this game. And she was cursed by a wizard spell that placed her under an eternal slumber until the Triforce of Courage was collected. Um, so Link needs to rebuild the Triforce of Courage and then use the entire Triforce, because he's currently holding power and wisdom, to uh, revive her. And so Zelda's passive here, but she is not kidnapped. She is asleep in a space where Link can visit her at any point. Um, so this is the first game where she's not kidnapped, but she is cursed. So it's kind of one of those catch-22 situations. Um, once the full Triforce is used to revive her, a curtain drops. She appears. The curtain then um, closes, if I remember right. And then you see them, see her move closer to Link, suggesting that they kiss, which is the first time that a romantic thing happens. And I find that disturbing because if I remember correctly in Zelda 2 um, lore, um, Zelda refused to marry a prince, and the prince hired this wizard to curse her. So it's just kind of. Uh, misogynistic in a sense to like just to have this plot and then like the moment that she's awakened by this guy she's like oh yeah I want to kiss you um again we've come a long way <laughs> there's still a lot of work to be done but we've come a long way since the 80s and how women were handled as uh, damsels so next up on the list we do have our first combination of of Zeldas because the Zelda in A Link to the Past and the Zelda in, or in the Oracle games on the Game Boy Color are the same Zelda. So in Link to the Past she's passive and she's kidnapped. Um, she's more active in the game than in the prior two because she's actually with you at the beginning. You rescue her from a cell which again she was kidnapped. So she's kidnapped twice so that's the first time we've had that happen. Um, you rescue Zelda, you take her to a church for sanctuary, but then Aghanim steals her away anyway. Um, 
So, just we'll get into like the actual lore now. So Link is summoned by Zelda as Algamon, an evil wizard, begins assaulting Hyrule Castle. Link finds her in the dungeons underneath the castle, and is, it is revealed that she is one of the descendants of the Seven Sages, whose life force serves as a key to free Ganon from the Dark World. She hides briefly in a local temple, but is found by Aghanim's forces and sent to the Dark World. Link finds his own way into the alternate dimension and rescues her and the other maiden descendants, which allows Link to enter the Great Pyramid and fight Ganon. So she appears in the beginning, and she appears at the end. But it's, again, it's not, she's not heavily involved with the plot. That's why I say she's passive. Um, and basically her role is to get kidnapped twice. She's kidnapped, you have to rescue her at the beginning, and then she's kidnapped again and you have to rescue her again. So that's why I say that she is passive. Um, in the Oracle games, Zelda's ruling over Hyrule. And when the two games are linked, she makes an appearance as Twin Roba's sacrifice to resurrect Ganon once more. While Link foils their effort, Twin Robas chooses to sacrifice themselves to bring Ganon back. So, Zelda doesn't even appear in the Oracle games until you link them. And is again kidnapped and rescued. So, again, just that particular iteration of Zelda is not great. Uh, Link's Awakening does not feature Zelda in either the original, DX, or the Switch remake. Um, she does get mentioned, but she's not actively a participant in the game. And it's the first time that she sits it out. Um, there's a couple more that she sits out. Alright, so here's our first, I would argue, active Zelda. And this is Ocarina of Time. So in Ocarina of Time, she still gets kidnapped. <laughs> um, it just takes a long time to get to that point. But this is the first game where Zelda is far more engaged with the plot and not immediately kidnapped. Um, it's also one where Zelda is like pushing the narrative in a much more significant manner. So Link runs into Zelda when he is still a child, and they both devise a plan to thwart Ganondorf from unlocking the Temple of Time. Uh, once Link finds the means to open the temple's doors, Ganondorf attacks Hyrule Castle, which forces Zelda to flee. Um, Link advances time by seven years by pulling the Master Sword, and Zelda has disguised herself as Sheik in order to avoid Ganondorf's clutches. And during the, the, the temples that Link explores, Sheik visits him often and teaches him songs to help him warp around Hyrule, as well as providing some advice. Um, once Link defeats all of the six temples and gets the six sage stones, or six seals, or whatever they're called, um, Sheik reveals her true nature as Zelda, but Ganondorf immediately pings to where she is and kidnaps her. So Link has to then go and rescue her. So after defeating Ganondorf, Zelda is rescued and helps Link escape the crumbling castle. But Ganon appears, enraged with the Triforce of Power, and becomes a giant boar beast. And Zelda is locked out of the final battle until the very end when she attacks with the power of the sages and a beam of light that weakens Ganon to the point that Link can deliver the final blow with the Master Sword. And then she returns him to his childhood via the Ocarina of Time. So that is Zelda's role. And so, yes, it is a lot better than all of the prior games. She is much more active. She's helping Link through the story. She gives him the Ocarina of Time. She's providing advice in a disguised form as Sheik when he's an adult. But she still gets captured the moment she becomes Zelda. And it just, it makes me wonder what, why they had to do that. Why couldn't Zelda just be Zelda for like a second, like just a flash and then stay as Sheik, and then maybe then show up at the end and and 
reveal herself as Zelda after Link defeats Ganondorf. It's like, did we need that extra layer of, of damsel in distressing to raise the stakes when the stakes were already high? You know what I mean? Um, so while it's an improvement, it's still not perfect. And um, it still went back into the Zelda has to be kidnapped in order for the game to work. Um, well of ideas that Nintendo loves to go back to for its main female characters in Peach and Zelda. Um, Majora's Mask, it's the same Link, but Zelda's only referenced. She doesn't physically appear. Alright, so we're moving ahead now into the Game Boy Advance era with Four Swords. Uh, this was included with the Link to the Past port to the Game Boy Advance. Um, she has a passive role here and is kidnapped. Um, so basically, Zelda and Link have been friends since childhood. Upon visiting the Four Sword Sanctuary together, they discover that the Wind Mage Vati has managed to escape, and Vati captures Zelda with the intention of making her his bride, which forces Link to rescue her with the Four Sword. Different villain, same same story, basically, as we will continue to see. So now we've got our another another duo. We've got the Wind Waker and Phantom Hourglass. This is also the first time where I have a, del a deliberate split in how the games treat this Zelda. So in Wind Waker, she's active, but in Phantom Hourglass, she's passive, and she's kidnapped in both. As you play through Wind Waker, Zelda's nowhere to be found. She is incognito. Um, but Link works closely with a pirate captain named Tetra. It is discovered that Tetra is actually Zelda and did not know it, but she was magically protected um, to prevent Ganondorf and his minions from figuring out where she was. As Tetra, she's one of the best versions of Zelda in the series. She's smarmy, she's confident, she's capable, she's brave and courageous. She's all these wonderful, wonderful traits that we haven't seen in the character before. Um, and she, she's a major part of the story because without Tetra, Link would still be stuck on Outset Island. I forget the name of the original island that Link starts on. His home island, we'll just say. Um, and she escorts him around until the King of Red Lions is found. Um, and she also helps him assault Ganondorf's fortress. So she's really important as Tetra for like the first half or so of the game. When the duo discover the time-locked ruins of Hyrule Castle, the King of Red Lions reveals that Zelda is his descendant. Um, but in fear of Ganondorf pinging in to, to Zelda's newfound revelation, they choose that it would be best for her to stay confined in the waterlogged Hyrule Castle in a sacred space where the Master Sword had laid dormant. And this is where the game really takes a bit of a nosedive in terms of Zelda's characterization because she loses a lot of what Tetra had. She loses the personality, she loses the agency, and ultimately loses her independence too because despite this is a sacred space, it doesn't matter. Ganondorf breaks through the defenses and manages to abduct her anyway. However, by the time Link in, um, encounters Ganondorf at the end of the game, Zelda is much more active in that final battle than she ever was up to that point. So like an Ocarina of Time, at the very end she shoots a beam of light. Here she's carrying the bow and shoots light arrows at Ganondorf while you fight him to help stun. So she is much more engaged in, in fighting Ganondorf in this game, and that's a good improvement. Um, once Ganondorf is defeated, she reverts back to being Tetra and continues to sail with her pirate crew, which leads to Phantom Hourglass. However, there, she is kidnapped and turned to stone for most of the game. <laughs> so a huge step back, which is really disappointing because Tetra is the most progressive of the Zeldas up to this point 
and will continue to be that way for a, a while. And Phantom Hourglass just basically nulls that, just cuts it right off. And it's really sad and disappointing that Nintendo chose to do that to the most, um, the most progressive Zelda so far. So in Four Swords Adventure, she's passive until the end. And she's kidnapped again. Um, so Vati is back. And Zelda has asked Link to help protect the Shrine Maidens as they seal Vati. Um, unfortunately, Link's shadowy self disrupts the ritual and captures Zelda and the Maidens, which causes Link to pull the Four Sword, which Vati was sealed by, so Vati has been freed as well. So now Link has to defeat Vati and Shadow Link, but Ganon's also pulled into this. So at the very end, Zelda helps you fight Ganon by shooting light balls that you can then hit at Ganon um, if you shoot an arrow through them and turn them into light arrows. So it's an improvement over four swords, but it is not much of an improvement over much else in Zelda's history as a character. So with the Minish Cap, she's passive, and she is kidnapped. Um, Link and Zelda are again childhood friends. They're on a visit, and a younger Vati has shown up and transformed the princess into a stone statue and whisks her off to the roof of Hyrule Castle, attempting to siphon the light magic within her. Um, in the end, Link subdues the mage, freeing Zelda from her prison. The two escape to encounter a transformed Vati, um, she does not help at the end, but after defeating this revised, revived version, Zelda is granted a wish by Elzo, Link's cap, who has regained his diminished form, and Zelda wishes for peace, which removes the monstrous malady infecting Hyrule. So, not too different from how she appeared in Link to the Past, honestly. So Twilight Princess, I feel, is the most disappointing Zelda out of all of these Zeldas, and all of the Zeldas to come. And I say that because the marketing materials showed Zelda to be more of a stoic and like warrior-like version than she ever has. There, like the concept art of her, she's got a sword. Um, when you first see her in concept art, she's got this hood on. So it just really kind of created this like vision of Zelda being much more engaged and like evicted or kicked out of the kingdom by Zant and it's like it just created like this mythos that did not end up being reality which was disappointing. Um, Zelda chooses to surrender her lands to Zant to minimize casualties to Hyrule citizens. She spends the t her time in the game in the Twi'le version of Hyrule um, locked in a tower for most of it and Link and Midna occasionally bump into her to do story stuff um, but it Midna's the princess of note in this game because she's always with you and she's got a great personality. This Zelda doesn't have much of anything to really go off of when you actually get to the end of the game and Ganondorf is revealed to be the actual bad guy, um, you fight Zelda for the first time as Phantom Zelda. I think is what they call her in that game. Possessed Zelda. Um, you have to defeat her before you fight Ganondorf. But once you do, then she becomes much more engaged and basically replicates what she did in Wind Waker to some extent, that she shoots light arrows at Ganondorf during the the mounted battle. But once that's done, she's passive again. Um, she's just not... She's a real back pedal, in my opinion. Because Ocarina of Time established her as more active. And then Wind Waker established her as more active. And then Twilight Princess was like, whoa... <laughs> Let's back up. So, honestly, that's one of my biggest disappointments with Twilight Princess. And I like that game a lot. Um, it's one of my favorites in the series. 
but the way they handled Zelda was really lousy. So I can't give that a, a positive endorsement on her treatment there. So Spirit Tracks is the most interesting one. This was the one I was hinting at earlier where you do actually get to play as Zelda for the first time. Um, so she's active here, but she's still kidnapped. But let me explain. So in this story, Zelda asks Link to join her to investigate the Tower of Spirits, but along the way, her soul is separated from her body and inhabits phantoms, um, which are sets of armor. And she helps Link fight off enemies and solve puzzles. So she's actually briefly playable before she loses her body, too. So that's, like, huge in terms of Zelda's agency in this series. She has not been playable up to this point in any way, but here you actually play as her in her physical body and then she assists Link and you use the DS to move her phantom armor around. So she's much more engaged with the plot. Unfortunately, her body is absconded off for a ritual to resurrect the demon king Maladus. So it's kind of, it's like, Again, we've got a Catch-22 here, where we have the most independent Zelda that's actually playable for the first time in this entire series, and yet her body is taken off somewhere um, and is corrupted by Maladus, and you have to actually deal with fighting Zelda, Zelda's body being corrupted by a male. It's, it's just, oh, it's just really bad. And in the end, however, Maladus is removed, and with a prayer to Tetra, which is a nice nod to the earlier Zelda in this timeline, Zelda reclaims her body and fights off Maladus with light arrows and gives Link the advantage to make the final blow. The two hold hands at the end, perhaps the second time a more romantic suggestion for their relationship has been posited by Nintendo. Um, and that's kind of, it's a continuation of the Wind Waker Phantom Hourglass timeline but it is a different Zelda um so this this game is interesting because a it's better than most and that you actually have some time to play as Zelda and she's much more active with helping Link but it's got this creepy um body snatcher inhabitation thing with a male entity that's really gross so <sighs> let's just move on Skyward Sword. Um, she's active, and she's kidnapped. But this is, I think, one of the better Zeldas in terms of how she's developed. Um, so in this game, this is the, the original Zelda in terms of the timeline established in Hyrule Historia. So Skyward Sword comes first chronologically in the game timeline in terms of like release of course it's pretty late but so this Zelda kind of starts it all so Zelda is a classmate of Link and the two have the closest relationship with the pairing yet they are very good friends and joke around with each other as the game progresses Zelda discovers she has a divine destiny after a choice typhoon sends her and her loft wing away from Skyloft and onto the surface she stumbles into Impa, who manages to protect her from the machinations of Garahim, who needs her to revive the Demon Lord Demise. So, Link is basically chasing after Zelda this entire game. Um, Zelda's out there doing what she needs to do to, to become... Um, a, I forget how they refer to her here. Um, the reincarnation of the goddess Hylia. So she's doing what she needs to do to do that, and she's visiting all these places that Link is. So it's kind of a throwback to the original Zelda and how she split up the Triforce of Wisdom and hid it in the dungeons that were full of monsters. But it's actually in the game this time. So Link is following behind her, trying to catch up, um, as Impa kind of helps protect Zelda as she does what she needs to do. Um... So it's not quite as badass because Impa is definitely much more of a warrior figure and is probably doing a lot of the fighting to protect Zelda in this case, in contrast to how Legend of Zelda 
position Zelda to be just doing it on her own. But it's still a much better plot line than in past games, other than maybe Ocarina of Time, where Zelda is just is independently choosing to do this with help from Impa. Um, eventually, Zelda and Link reconnect, and Zelda reveals that she's the reincarnation, must enter a crystal in order to enter a deep sleep to counteract the rising darkness from the Demon Lord Demise. Unfortunately for us and for the game, Garahim captures Zelda and is forced to enter Demise's soul, which again is kind of taking the spirit tracks, putting a female body inside of a male soul to provide power and it's gross, I don't like it, let's not do that. Um, once Link defeats the Demon Lord, Zelda is freed and the two choose to remain on the surface to protect the Master Sword and the Triforce and set up all of the other Links and Zeldas in the future. Um, so, in a lot of ways this is better, but it still ends in the same <sighs> sexist way that almost all of the Zelda games have ended, which is Zelda being put into a situation where she is either kidnapped or shoved into some, some male entity to provide them power, and it really needs to stop. A Link Between Worlds. She is passive here, and she is kidnapped. Um, in this one, Zelda rules over Hyrule alone and summons Link to investigate the disappearance of the sage Ceres. Sending Link with a pendant and a message for the wise Shrahashrila. <laughs> I really don't know why they kept that name, because that is really hard to say. Yuga, who is the primary antagonist, manages to overpower Hyrule Castle while Link is on his adventures and traps Zelda and their remaining sages in paintings and whisks them all into the dark realm of Low Rule where he merges into Ganon's essence. These paintings have been spread throughout the kingdom of Low Rule, and once they are rescued, they become the Seven Sages and help Link defeat Yuga and Ganon, and then Zelda and Link restore Low Rule's Triforce before returning to Hyrule. So, ultimately, it's, like, it's basically Link to the Past all over again, where Zelda's in the beginning, you talk to her, she sets up the quest, and then you leave, and she's gone until the end of the game. So, we're now up to Hyrule Warriors, which is the best Legend of Zelda game in terms of how they treat Zelda, which is kind of odd, because this is a Warriors game made by Team Ninja, creators of Dead or Alive, and some of the most sexist video games in existence. And yet, they got Zelda right. <laughs> it still blows my mind every time I think about it. So, Zelda is a general and princess in Hyrule Warriors who is being sought out by Saya's forces due to jealousy about Zelda's beauty. Um, that's kind of where the, uh, the sexism is, is in Lana and Saya, the OCs in Hyrule Warriors. They didn't do it with the characters that pre-exist. They did it with their own characters. So, yay? <laughs> um, she disguises herself as Sheik after the first map, but eventually reveals her true self after Link and Sheik are trapped by Saya and their Triforce is stolen to open pathways to other timelines. However, Zelda remains free and a viable asset on the battlefield, and this is the only Legend of Zelda game in the entire canon where this is the case except for the next Hero Warriors game, but I'm going to get to that. Um, she aids Link in sealing Ganon with light arrows and seals the King of Evil away with the Master Sword at the end of the game. So, Zelda is never captured. She is briefly trapped, as is Link, by Saya and has her Triforce of Wisdom taken. And that is what reverts her back to being Zelda, because she doesn't have that magic anymore. Um, Sheik is still playable, though, so it's not really... It's not really... This is a... It's a Warriors game. The plot is kind of secondary. Um, so... Best game in terms of how Zelda's actually handled. Um, she also has a lot of movesets. She has, I think, three... Three or four different weapons as her Zelda self. She's there as Sheik. And then with DLC, you can also get Tetra, 
and Toon Zelda, which is her Spirit Tracks version, so you can control a train. <laughs> and Phantom Armors and stuff. So, Zelda's handled extremely well in this game. It's her best appearance, except maybe Hyrule Wars Age of Calamity, but I'm going to get to that. Um, and it still blows me away that it was Team Ninja that did it. Alright, Triforce Heroes. Zelda does not appear in Triforce Heroes. This is the second game where she doesn't really have any major role at all. Because um, in Majora's Mask, she's in flashback things. But I would say Link's Awakening and Triforce Heroes are the two oddities in the series where Zelda doesn't have any major role. Um, but Link can wear a costume based on her look in Link Between Worlds. And now we're into Breath of the Wild. So I'm lumping Breath of the Wild, Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, and Breath of the Wild 2 all together here. And this is my favorite Zelda in the entire series. Um, she's active, but she's not exactly kidnapped. And I'm going to explain why I say that, because it's still framed in an odd way. So in this, time, in this version of Zelda, she is a researcher and a scholar, but she is forced away from her passion and science towards the divine expectation as, of being the descendant of the fabled princesses of lore. She is not a willing participant in her agent, leg, legacy as Zelda. She wants to study the Chica technology and utilize it to deal with the issues of the day, but her aspirations are constantly dashed by her father and the royal court's gossip. Reluctantly, she attempts to touch her magical talent by mimicking trials of her ancestors, such as bathing in mythical springs and soul-searching. All the while, Link serves as her bodyguard, and the two share an interesting relationship where Zelda's frustrations and loneliness boil over onto him, but she also tries to appreciate his simplistic nature and earnestness. When Link saves her from a Yiga clan assassination attempt, her mood changes, and she begins to value his stead steadfast conviction to her. Now, it is around this time where Age of Calamity starts taking place. And so, I haven't finished playing Age of Calamity, so I don't know all of the story beats. I do know that they do take a few liberties with the canon, because they send a um, little mini-guardian back in time um, to warn the characters of what's to come. So, I'm not 100% sure how how tight this actually is. Um, she does have two playable forms. I do know that much. She does have her, her original, like, um, blue tunic and, and brown pants look, where she uses the Sheikah Slate to attack, and then she's also got her divine form, where she's using the Triforce of Wisdom to attack. Um, so I'm going to not get into Hyrule Wars Age of Calamity any more than that, other than she's playable in that. It's wonderful. The Sheikah Slate version is bonkers <laughs> the best way possible. Um, and I'm looking forward to actually getting into it. I just need a Pro Controller because I, I can't play it with the GameCube controller. So, upon the revival of Blight Ganon, the reanimation of the Sheikah weaponry and the protected Divine Beast being corrupted, Zelda unlocks her magical potential and then spends 100 years holding off the darkness of Hyrule Castle, while Link, who suffered a fatal, not a fatal, but a severe blow, um, sleeps during Zelda's tribulations and awakens fully healed after 100 years. Um, Zelda reappears to him and connects him to what's going on in Hyrule and, and her personal battle with Calamity Gen. There we go. Calamity Gen. Um... So, as you go through Breath of the Wild, Link finds memories that retell, like, his history with Zelda. And it's really sweet, and it's really well done. Um, and if you get all of the memories, you get the best ending, where Zelda and Link are together doing research. And basically doing what she wants to do, and he's doing what he wants to do, which is to be with her. And it's nice, it's really great. And I'm hoping, and now we're finally to the end... I'm hoping that Breath of the Wild 2 will will further their relationship, further Zelda's involvement, and not whisk her away so she's absent from the game. Ideally, I want this to be the second mainline game where she's playable. Um, and I'm feeling that with her shorter hair and her outfit, that she's 
being poised to be a playable character. Um, Link's getting corrupted by whatever was possessing the corpse of who appears to be Ganondorf. Um, and my hope is that he 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 becomes the one that has to be saved, and we get a flip of the of the gender roles in this series. I would love that. I would love it if Zelda was the person who had to save Link, and then maybe the two of them could have shared playtime. That would be awesome. I would love that so much. Um, but that is basically Zelda's entire history in the series. Um, this isn't getting into like the Smash series where she's been playable since Melee. That That is Zelda in a nutshell. And I hope, my hope, my hope, my hope is that Breath of the Wild 2 finally makes her a important, valued character and not just in the title and not just to the story, but to the player, to the overall game play as well. So I've got pickups, uh, two separate pickups actually. Um, I will give you a bit of forewarning that the first pickup video that will follow the cat intermission, I was sick and not very energetic. <laughs> I was recovering from my COVID vaccine. Um, so I'm a little quiet and I apologize for that. I am much more animated and uh, loud, <laughs> I guess I'll say, in the second pickup part. But. Uh, Let's jump into some cat shenanigans, and I'll see you on the other side. Hello there. Welcome to Levels Plus Weekly Wildcat JF Got the COVID Vaccine Edition. Um, I got the second dose two days ago, so I'm still reeling from that. At the very least, the arm pain's gone away, but I just feel pretty lousy. So my energy level is going to be kind of low, but uh, I do have something to open this week. And I didn't want to wait till I felt better to open it. So I'm going to go ahead and dive right in. So what's in the box, I hear you ask? Well, given the size, it's obviously something considerable. Or I got many of one thing. But uh, it is just one thing. big box. It is, if the light allows it to be shown, the Blaster Master Zero and Blaster Master Zero 2 Collector's Edition from Limited Run Games. Um, I'm pretty excited to have this because I really like these games and coincidentally we just got a announcement for the third game. So I also got these cool cards. A one for zero and one for zero two. Focus isn't working out too great. I apologize. But you can kind of see them. And that's the box art a little bit better. So what came in this thing? Uh, let's go ahead and open it up and we'll find out. Um, it's kind of funny because I've been talking about Blaster Master Zero quite a bit the last day or so. Um, 
but I'll get into that momentarily. So just kind of a, a funny coincidence that this finally made its way to me. Alright, so per the huge, there's the slip case. Um, I actually think I like the box more without the slip case because it's all shiny. Let me uh, show off the shinies. See the shinies? Ooh. So, came with this certificate of authenticity. So, I got number 2,707 out of 300. No, 3,645, which is pretty neat. And then it also came with this art print for this edition, which is pretty cool. And then the big selling point for the deluxe edition are these little metal replicas of Sophia the Third. So this is from Blaster Master Zero's model. And this is the Blaster Master Zero 2 model. Uh, these are really nice, actually. They look a lot better than they did in the promo. Um, that's really cool. So that was kind of why I actually wanted to go for the deluxe edition for these was um, because of these little tanks. On top of that, there are, there's a CAD thinking about getting in my shot. There's also these reproduction carts. Uh, Limited Run likes to do these. So for zero and zero two. And then the games themselves in their fancy, fancy box. So let's go ahead and open up Zero first. All right, so inside of Blaster Master Zero box is a whole bunch of other stuff. So let's get it all out. So it comes with the soundtrack. For the game, which is cool because I really like the Blaster Master Zero soundtrack. A gigantic poster that's double sided, which is Jason and Eve and Fred all hanging out, and the Sophia the Third is huge, and there's some enemy stuff going on. And then the back side is this. And then comes with this cute little limited run case. Um, and the switch thing. I'm going to leave that in the box. And then it comes with Blaster Master Zero for the switch. Um, I played this on the 3DS. Uh, so it'll be interesting to play it on a bigger screen. Uh, it also includes all the DLC. So Shovel Knight and Shantae and Gunvolt and Ikoro are all here. Um, Blaster Master Zero is a really good game. I like it a lot. Um, I think that it's probably the best game Inti Creates has done, in my opinion. Um, the sequel is good. It's just... It, it made some decisions in terms of the execution that I'm not as big of a fan of. Alright, so I am getting the uh, zero 02 one open. Um, unsurprisingly, zero 02 comes with basically the same stuff, so it'll have the soundtrack and a poster. Here is zero 02 without the slipcase. And here is the soundtrack with 
boopy E <laughs> background and silhouette. Uh, that's really my biggest issue with a Blaster Master Zero 2 is how the women designs in that game got a lot worse, especially in regards to Eve. Um, so here's the here's the Switch cart, or case, I should say. Um, I do believe that this also has the DLC on it, but I'm not 100% sure. And then let me get the poster out. Other side A of the poster. Um, I really like the art for the Zero series. I just wish that two dialed back with the, the fan service a bit. Because um, Eve somehow got much larger breasts between the first and the second game. <laughs> and, of course, the infamous uh, character that has literal watermelons on her chest. All right, well, that is all of the Blaster Master Zero One and Two Collector's Edition. We're the Final Fantasy X Two of, Final, of Levels Plus Weekly right now. <laughs> all right, so I got another box, and I am no longer sick. So, uh, I've got something new. I'm excited to open it. Let's check out what's inside, because Finn also wants to see what's inside. I think he actually just would be happy with the box, to be completely honest. All right. Surprises, games. All right, let's move this aside, and I will show you what I got. So, a uh, forum friend of mine um, was selling some stuff. I reached out and said, "Hey, I'm interested in a couple things." So, I've got our type final. Um, complete. Um, I'm excited to try our type final. I've heard good things. I've got the sequel on pre-order for the Switch. Uh, this was one of Irem's last games as Irem. Um, so I'm uh, kind of excited to try that out. And next up, physical Soikoden 3. I now have all of the numbered Soikoden games. That's super exciting. I only don't have tactics at this point. And uh, I don't really care to get tactics. <laughs> because I have played it before, I have owned it, and I don't really care. And then last but not least is the PS1 Star Ocean, the second story. Um, I have heard that this is the best Star Ocean. Um, this one doesn't have the manual, but that's fine. Looks like both the discs are here. Um, it's an Enix series that I've, I've not dabbled with yet. I'm very happy to have these. Um, I did not expect 2021 to be the year that my PlayStation 2 collection doubled in size. And yet here we are. And honestly, I've not ever come across these three games in the wild before. So, uh, very pleased to have all of them in my collection now. And uh, someday I'll be able to play uh, R-Type Final. Um, I can play Soikin in 3 on my PS3 because I have the PS2 Classic. Um, and I can play Star Ocean on my PS3. So I will probably dive into that at some point. But right now... Um, I'm actually about to start so I could in three for reels. Um, I was kind of goofing around with it um, Sunday a little bit to kind of test out the memory card transfer and all that. Um, I think I might have got it set up, but uh, that's my next big RPG project is so I could in three. I'm very excited. Um, I love one and two. And then uh, maybe I'll try Star Ocean later this year. I don't know if I should play the remake of the first one or this one first. I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to see. Anyway, 
That's the end of Levels Plus Weekly for this week. I hope that uh, you have a wonderful week. And I will see you on the next one. Take care.